Hey everybody, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. What's the future of health? I am talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we are meeting the new chief medical officer of Vita Health, Dr. Patrick Carroll, who's got an incredible background in virtual care, virtual pharmacy. He was the former chief medical officer at Hims and Hers, which just went public at the beginning of 2021. And before that was the chief medical officer of Walgreens. So talk about a pedigree in terms of consumer focused retail virtual health wow <laughs> nice to meet you yeah great to be here jessica and i'm really looking forward to uh, joining vita health as their inaugural chief medical officer this is so exciting i think not only for vita but i think also for where we're at in terms of the health tech approach to chronic condition management so i'd like to pick your brain because i mean like i said you've been around for a while in this space and i i i, I don't often come across clinicians who've got such a breadth of experience at such great organizations in terms of both the retail side of things and then the virtual side of things. I mean, so this is really exciting. And I'm curious to, to jump into some trends here because I know your, your brand spanking you and your job. So I'm curious about how you're gonna how you're gonna approach you know this chronic condition management in a virtual world. Because I mean I think up until this point, you know, I mean we've been seeing particularly in the past four or five years as these companies Companies like Vita Health or Omada Health or Livongo gain traction in the marketplace and adoption by you know, large self-insured employers and health plans, the integration of these different kinds of, you know, they call them point solutions into the way that we're delivering chronic condition care. I'm curious as you walk into Vita, you know, what have you seen in the in terms of the way that we are treating chronic conditions? How has that changed over time? And you know, how are you planning to build in what you've learned about this change into what you're going to do? at Vita? Yeah, great question. To, to really understand my mindset, you have to go back in time. When I first started as a family physician, primary care physician, my career was informed and is informed by the six years I spent with the Indian Health Service. So I came out of my residency as a family physician in Shiprock, New Mexico, and you have a large population with multiple chronic conditions uh, with a very, very limited budget. And we were accountable to deliver high value care with limited resources and to show that the outcomes really achieved what we needed to achieve in order to deliver great care at a price point that was affordable because we were under a very strict budget with the Indian Health Service. So coming out of that experience, I went into primary care as a family physician, You know, had a panel of 3000 patients, traditional primary care. I saw everyone from nursery to nursing homes. A lot, of, a lot of my time was spent with uh, folks with chronic conditions, things like diabetes and hypertension and uh, elevated cholesterol and depression. And so through the years, what I came to realize is that all of those were intertwined and interrelated as you got to know families and you got to treat folks with multiple conditions that challenged their everyday lives. Um, it's hard to treat one in isolation. It was such overlap. Um, so that's my background and, and that, that's my DNA. You know, I'm a primary care physician for over 30 years in the trenches, seeing those 30 patients per day. And what I began to realize in my career is the traditional model was really unsustainable. Um, there's a shortage of primary care providers. We're probably looking at 50,000 short in the next few years. Um, and there's an increase in incidence and prevalence of chronic diseases. So the traditional model just doesn't really work anymore. So we had to look at more in creative ways to deliver healthcare. And so, Coming back uh, from my last stint with Indian Health Service in 2011, I actually uh, started taking more leadership roles in healthcare, uh, overseeing a large multi-specialty group in Boston, and then as a chief medical officer for a large integrated delivery network in Connecticut. And then five years at Walgreens, where I really learned about how pharmacy uh, and adherence, medication adherence really impacts healthcare. Uh, Loved my time at Walgreens, was there as five years uh, as chief medical officer, learned a lot. Um, but what I saw was that there was new and innovative ways to deliver healthcare, particularly in the virtual healthcare space. That sort of attracted me to hims and hers. 
I enjoyed my time there. I saw where digital health was going. I didn't have a crystal ball. I didn't see the pandemic coming. I joined six months before the pandemic. Uh, what I was happy and, and really proud of it at Hims and Hers, we expanded scope of care and became more of a full telehealth company as we looked at all of these conditions we treated virtually. What really attracted me, though, to uh, Vita Health and taking on this position is really my experience going back to the Indian Health Service, really the uh, prevalence, the burden of chronic illnesses in this country. And so if you actually look at chronic diseases, it, it accounts for almost 90% of the healthcare costs in this country, almost 90%. Amazing. Um, you know, 40% of our population has two or more chronic conditions. And as a primary care physician, I learned, and as the more and more data comes out, it actually validates that all of these conditions are related. Um, you know, today, 10% of the population has diabetes. But if you're a diabetic, um, you have about a 70% chance of having elevated blood pressure and hyperlipidemia, elevated cholesterol. And really overlying all of this is actually behavioral health issues. Um, folks with complex diabetes, they have three to four times the risk of having uh, depression. Uh, so you just can't treat one condition in isolation. You really need to address all of the conditions in a holistic manner. That's really what drew me and excites me about the work at Vita Health, because that is at the core of what they're trying to do is to really look at healthcare, particularly chronic disease and chronic conditions in a holistic manner. So that holistic side of things, I mean, I'm curious about your, your take on this, particularly because of your background, you know, and, and, and you, you said, you know, when you were working with the, um, with those patients in New Mexico, you know, not being not being able to see how that model of a, of a primary care centric approach with that type of a population is was really sustainable, really with any population, right? I mean, the, the sustainability of that is difficult because it's all on one clinician and there's a shortage of clinicians. Right. So what are you seeing, Pat, as like the opportunity here in terms of what you will be able to build out virtually with Vita. I mean, like, talk to me about this whole virtual care delivery side of things and the opportunity you really see there in terms of reaching more patients, in terms of pro providing more of that integrated approach. I mean, I'd like to hear from you, like where, where you see virtual being able to really deliver on a lot of the things that an in-person care model either couldn't based on its design or you know, wouldn't be able to in as cost-effective of a manner. Yeah, you know, our, our goal at Vita is not to replace the primary care physician. We, we want to become part of the patient center medical home, but we can offer services, whether that be coaching, uh, uh, CDCSs, you know, certified uh, diabetic educators uh, for folks with diabe diabetes, uh, coaches for behavioral health, counselors for behavioral health, uh, all of that support that primary care providers need to actually improve healthcare. So the VITA model is fascinating to me in the respect, even though today they don't have a prescriber model, in other words, they don't have a virtual primary care group to, to do prescriptions, through coaching and through counseling, they've been able to achieve remarkable, really compelling outcomes without even involvement in the prescribing piece. But what they can provide to primary care providers is actually uh, that support um, that patients need in their care journeys. And then also information fed to the primary care providers. You know, we have uh, continued glucose monitors. We do, we have, uh, uh, you know, ways to track blood sugars. We have smart skills, all of this data. And then we tee it up and, and transfer that information to primary care providers and to payers who are also actually also very accountable for quality and cost of care and to employers. So we're actually doing a lot of that work and then feeding that into the entities that are responsible for that care and helping them achieve with their, their uh, customers with their patients, the goals that need to get done. 
Talk to me about that integration and maybe some of the ideas that you have there in terms of how to integrate. Because, you know, I mean, like Vita's client base is, you know, we've got the large self-insured employers like Cisco and Visa and eBay, we've got health plans, Centene, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Humana. You know, so, I mean, when you, t- when you think about having to integrate into legacy healthcare delivery environments. You know, I mean, how do you do that? And I'm really curious about this based on your background as, as a doctor, as a primary care physician, because, you know, I mean, th- th- there's gotta be that, that seamless data exchange, you know, and not only for the, the patient to experience less friction, but also for the clinicians to work together and experience less friction. So what are some of your, what are some of your ideas there in terms of integration and, you know, helping those traditional care providers deliver on the omni-channel experience that, that I know they want to build out, like the last couple of years proved that, um, but also that you guys have been adept at, or Vita Health has been adept at doing for the last couple of years. I mean, talk a little bit about that. How do you see the integration going? What are some, what are some of your thoughts there about how you're going to approach that? Right. Boy, it would be great if we had a national health information exchange solution, right? Wouldn't Where, it? <laughs> yeah, if you showed up at one hospital, they had all your records from the prior hospital where you used to live and all the records from your primary care physicians. That's nirvana, but that's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, you know, um, patients are on disparate EMRs. They don't communicate well. Uh, we make a real effort at Vita. Our coaches are our providers in terms of communicating with primary care providers. So we, you know, identify with that patient who their PCP is and, and work as best we can to get information to that primary care provider. You know, it's, it's interesting, though, if you actually look at the behavioral health space, um, we have a huge access problem for behavioral health in this country. Mm-hmm. As a primary care provider, I wouldn't even know where to send my patients to see a psychiatrist, many of them who don't take insurance, or to a counselor to access those services. So in particularly with the behavioral health space, the counseling that we offer, the coaching that we offer, um, we try to as best we can to get that information, information to providers. But I think providers are just grateful that we're providing that service at all, um, quite honestly. Um, just like I, I, as a primary care provider, I would not be upset if, if, if Vita worked with the employer of one of my patients and provided really great coaching and CDCS support around diabetes and, and as best I could see what information that they could provide me. But even short of having that seamless connection, there's value in everything you do when you're helping provide those services to to patients. So for employers, for example, um, we provide these services, we we identify the primary care provider and the employer is not connected to those primary care providers, but we transmit as much information as possible to that primary care provider. But ultimately we have to show as a company what we do provides value that's in terms of reduction in total health care costs, improvement in the health of their uh, population, and and keeping folks so they can actually, you know, go to work and and not be out all the time managing these chronic diseases. So, you know, we're, we're accountable to employers for that. For payers, you know, we do have data exchanges. You know, we work with two large payers today. They share uh, some of their claims data in a HIPAA compliant manner, uh, such that we can help them with things like achieve star metrics, you know, reduction mm-hmm. in hemoglobin A1Cs for diabetes. Um, in, uh, in other, you know, markets, we work with a large uh, payer in an ACA population where we're able to show reduction in hemoglobin A1C, um, uh, reduction in inpatient admissions, you know, reduction in ambulatory sensitive, sensitive admissions. And, and we actually have shown with that ACA group that we actually increase the PCP visit rate approaching 10%. So we are trying to push those patients from the payer side back into their primary care provider. We're not, we're not providing services in a, in a silo. And then I think another area of opportunity that we're looking at, <clears throat> particularly with my experience, is how do we partner with large medical groups, you know, health systems, medical groups? Um, they face the same challenges, you know, complex diabetics, 30% of diabetics are, are complex. In other words, they have multi-chronic diseases, they're not achieving the hemoglobin A1C levels that they need to. Management of a diabetic patient is, is very complex these days. You know, there's 40 different medications and 10 different drug classes. 
But Lord is a primary care physician. I had a hard time keeping up with that. Yeah. So we we'll talk to one of these medical groups. We'll say, look, we can provide the coaching, the counseling, um, and then we can work with you to either feed that data into your primary care providers or your specialists so they can do the prescribing. Or we are going to look very intentionally at uh, perhaps that last mile, building a virtual provider group such that uh, VIA can do that prescribing um, if, if those uh, partners have that type of need. Well, you, that's certainly in your wheelhouse, sir. Yeah, <laughs> so. I've done that. Yeah, been there. Um, I want to know about, you know, on the, and this is, it's so interesting to me because I love, I love your, I love the fact that, you know, as a primary care doctor, you, you understand what these other primary care physicians are going through in terms of wanting to care for their patients, wanting to improve their outcomes, and, you know, wanting to have the support that it takes to do that effectively. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, on the virtual side though, like part of your job, you know, you're going to be managing like over a thousand different clinicians and they're all along like the care providing spectrum. I mean, everything from registered dietitians and diabetes educators to health coaches, mental health providers, you know, in, in terms of, you know, leading that group within Vita, you know, how do you, one of the things that I, I'm curious about is, you know, how you anticipate, you know, helping them kind of build theory relationships with patients. I mean, one of the critiques always about virtual has been, well, you know, there's, there's an inability for the virtual care provider to build a relationship with their patients the same way that a primary care provider would when they are able to see them, you know, face to face or see them, you know, and have a, a continuous relationship with them over time. So, I mean, right. what, what do you say to that? Because I mean, I think like for me, I'm always like, well, maybe we need to rethink or reset our expectations about what we want from a, a patient provider relationship in the scope of virtual. But I'm curious to hear about what your thoughts are in terms of, of what you'd like to build there for the clinicians that you'll be managing. Yeah, absolutely. So they have a system today that works. So I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Believe me, I would not be coming to, to Vita uh, if they did not have proven great results. So I know okay. the model today <laughs> works because I'm not going to start from you know square one to try to build out an entire coaching uh, engagement platform. Uh, so I love what they've done today. They've got the leadership, uh, you know, uh, below me in place to continue to, to deliver great outcomes. Um, I think what I can offer that group is just some guidance of, from my experience, where healthcare may be going. Is it going to be totally vir total virtual primary care? Probably not. What do payers want? Uh, we're actually bringing on a, a high level physician with deep payer experience is going to help oversee our payer programs, Dr. Uh, Richard Frank. So we're excited to, to bring him on board as a full-time person overseeing the payer end. Um, but we're not going to recreate a lot of what works. Um, what I would, you know, push back a little bit on is uh, we're not trying to solve healthcare through an app. Sure, we're a high-tech company. Sure, we have peripherals. We get data points on things like blood sugars and track, you know, PHQ-9s and GAD-7s around uh, depression and anxiety. But we are a very, very high-touch uh, company. And so a diabetic who we've identified through an employer or a payer, and that, that, that initial four to six weeks with them, our, our registered dietitian may be reaching out to them one to two times per week initially. And they're having, sure, it's virtual in terms of video, but they're connecting with these, these members, with these customers on a regular basis. They're establishing a relationship with these customers. And I think the proof is actually in the, in the results. You know, NPS scores, we approach and actually exceed 80% for our programs. That doesn't happen if you're totally disconnected right. from your customers. This is not health solving healthcare with an app. This is solving healthcare in a virtual, although very efficient model that's very accessible, but that is extremely high touch. Uh, we feel there's a need for that high touch as well as for the tech aspect and to marry the two together to get the results that we've been able to achieve. 
I'm on this, I'm on your side, Pat. I mean, I, I feel like <laughs> virtual gives an opportunity to clinicians that they wouldn't otherwise have if it was not Absolutely. virtual. I mean, three or four times, I can't remember the last time I talked to my primary care doctor, but I do remember the last couple of times I talked to my therapist <laughs> <laughs> who is virtual. Um, all right, I wanna ask, transitioning a little bit here, you know, I'm curious, to, to get your thoughts on VITA's at-risk model, because I know you've got a big value-based care background here. Right. VITA decided to go 100% at-risk on outcomes for both physical and mental health outcomes, which is standout in the industry right now. So curious to hear your thinking about the at-risk model here that, that VITA operates. You know, what is this what is the what is the thing that we need to understand from a clinical perspective about you know providing chronic condition care both mental and physical you know in in an at risk model i mean where is the opportunity there in your mind in terms of delivering better care and also driving down the cost i love their at risk model uh, i'm surprised more companies have not done it quite honestly right? <laughs> if you don't believe in your product if you don't believe that you can achieve the results you shouldn't be in business. Um, you know, through the years in my leadership roles, I get pitched so many different solutions. We can do this, we can do that. And, and my question always would be to these companies, uh, are you willing to take risk? Are you willing to, you know, put, put the money where your mouth is on it? And this, well, maybe, you know, that's tough. We don't have the data. Look, uh, we are going to take risk in terms of customer engagement. That's you know who the percentage of folks that engage with us, the results, whether that be on behavioral health with movement of PHQ9s and GAD7s or, or diabetes with movement and improvement of hemoglobin A1Cs. We know, you know, kind of the key the KPIs and, and what we're going to be held accountable for, and we're willing to take risk on it. To me, it's very simple. Um, if, if you can't stand behind your product on what you deliver, um, why should someone purchase it? <laughs> right? I love that. <laughs> that. And, and so we're able to do that because we have years of sustained good results. You just right. can't, I understand as a new company and a, and a new player out there, if you're a new company and a new startup, you can't say, well, we're, we're going to guarantee it because you just don't have those results. Well, Vita has a legacy of good results that they can stand behind and are willing to put um, the money on the table to guarantee those results. So I think it, it's, it's, you know, from what I gather, it's been very well received in the market. I, I just, I just think it's going to be a great value proposition. On the on the cost savings side, because you can't you can't accomplish the the triple aim here without reducing costs, right? So how how do you how do you plan on kind of tackling this? I mean, I know you're it's early days there for you, but I mean, like knowing knowing your background, particularly yeah. at Hims and Hers, I mean, and and having this experience building out a virtual ecosystem, virtual care delivery infrastructure. What are some of the opportunities on the medical cost savings side? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge opportunity, and, and, and we have a separate team, health economics team, that looks at this every day, looks at the results we've achieved, and, and link that to actually um, the dollar saved. Um, this is particularly important for employers, but really, really important for payers. You don't get a contract with the payer unless you can show reduction in total cost of care, as well as quality outcomes. The great thing about management of chronic conditions, if you improve quality, you know, for example, you reduce the hemoglobin A1C by one point, um, there's a definite dollar amount in terms of cost savings attributed to that. Now there's debate whether that's $500 per year or $3,000 per year, but it's there. And we actually have a team that tracks that and will be, and has shown that through our programs, we're able to show cost savings, um, significant cost savings um, uh, that is very attractive to, as I said, <coughs> leaders first and foremost, but also employers. Um, so improvement of quality definitely is linked to reduction in cost of care. So it's a win-win situation. 
All right, Pat, last thing for you, as we welcome you to your new job at Vita Health, I want to know, what are you most excited about? I mean, like, especially looking back at your career trajectory, I mean, primary care doctor for so long, you know, head into health system, head into Walgreens, head into a health tech pharmacy startup that goes public. I mean, things are getting more and more exciting here, if you ask me, but like, yeah. what are you most excited about? I, I love challenges. Um, as I, you know, started off this conversation in terms of my background, uh, I have a passion to deliver care um, that, you know, that's accessible, but also can manage challenging uh, problems in healthcare, which is chronic conditions. It is the biggest challenge we have in healthcare. Uh, what I'm really excited about in joining Vita is they already have the team in place that shows that they can make an impact. I think we can just make even more of an impact as we grow the programs um, and then explore new programs or the addition of, of programs onto Vita Health um, in, in that space. Again, um, maybe that will be a prescriber network. Maybe that is the last mile for, for Vita Health. Um, we'll explore all of that. Um, for me, it's at this point in my career, it's, it's working with a great team uh, to make a real impact. All right. It can definitely feel that passion for care coming through. And also, I think, honestly, Pat, you're passionate about the startup space. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Well, we look forward to watching what it is that you do there as, as your tenure gets underway. We're going to definitely be looking at this prescriber network thing that you teased us about. So we'll have our eyes on what, what happens there and how that all unfolds. But thank you so much for joining us and for giving us a little bit of an insight on how you're going to be approaching this new role and, and all the things that you're going to be looking at building out over there at Vita Health. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. I enjoy chatting. Thank you. All right, everybody. That was Dr. Patrick Carroll. He is the new chief medical officer over there at Vita Health. I'm Jessica DeMassa. And for more interviews with the who's who of health tech as they are changing the way that we do healthcare, check out my YouTube channel over there at youtube.com slash WTF Health. We'll talk to you guys real soon. Thanks again. And Pat, congrats on the new job. Thanks. <laughs>